So the vi video is being recorded and we'll post it to APCD's website afterward for anybody who wasn't able to join us for this meeting. And um, in order to speak, uh, if you have a question, feel free to, to, to raise it at any point, but be sure to raise your hand first, just so we can make sure that everybody has a ch chance to speak without being spoken over. Um, to raise your hand, click on the participants button. It's the blue little person there uh, and hover over your name and next to your name, there's a little hand you can click on to raise. Uh, if you're joining us by phone, press star three to raise your hand and we can unmute you uh, so that you can ask your question. Uh, so you are, you can unmute yourself. You can turn your video on or off at any time too. Um, there is also a chat function, the little chat button. Uh, you feel free to put questions in the chat at any point, uh, and we'll try to get around to them as soon as we can. Uh, somebody else, Michelle, is, is actually going to be monitoring that chat for me. So, Michelle, feel free to any time if a question comes through that needs to be answered. Uh, okay. Liz, I'll say, what's that? That I will do. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, last thing, thank you all for attending um, very much. We really appreciate everybody coming uh, and participating in this. Uh, I apologize for any background noise. Uh, I think everybody's accustomed to it at this point, but uh, that is the, the world we live in now. Um, so we are discussing Regulation 5.15 version 4. Uh, the It's officially titled Chemical Accident Prevention Provisions, but it is more an, informally known as the Risk Management Plan Rule uh, or RMP rule uh, for the plan that is required of companies subject to the rule. Just to give you guys a brief overview, RMP chemical accident prevention provisions. Uh, to start off, I'm gonna go through just a little bit of history. Uh, so the Clean Air Act amendments that were passed in 1990 uh, incorporated a number of changes uh, and the chemical accident prevention provisions were a new section of the air toxics portion of the Clean Air Act in 1990, Section 112R, and that was subject uh, that that was uh, passed by Congress in large part due to accidents such as the one four years earlier in Bhopal, India, which killed several thousand, if not hundreds of thousands, of people. Uh, seeing that sort of catastrophic accident uh, is part of what inspired Congress. Uh, in 1996, six years after the adoption of the Clean Air Act amendments in 1990, EPA adopted their initial. Uh, 40 CFR Part 68 rule. That's where the uh, the regulation implementing Section 112R is found in the federal regulations. And then three years later, that um, implementation of the rule was delegated to APCD uh, for implementation here in Louisville. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to DJ Fountain uh, to give you guys a brief overview of the oops. Uh, RMP rule here in Louisville uh, and nationally, how it's structured and how we implement it. DJ? Yeah, thanks, Byron. Um, yeah, just a, a little brief overview. Um, so there's three major elements to the risk management program. Um, hazard assessment, um, that is kind of what it sounds like where people uh, will analyze what hazards are present due to the uh, subject chemicals at the plant. Um, the prevention program, which obviously companies would initiate in order to try to prevent a program. This includes things such as mechanical integrity, um, operating procedures, uh, employee training, and, and a variety of different measures that the companies have to take on. And then a response program. Um, in some cases, that is as simple as defining what conditions would uh, require the company to notify emergency responders from the community. In some cases, uh, plants have their own response team that is trained and equipped uh, to respond to any kind of unforeseen emergency that might occur. So locally, um, how we do this is we have an we have an agreement with emergency management agency, and in addition to responding to any releases that may occur, uh, they provide the inspection function. So they are familiar with the companies, with the individuals who are in charge of the processes of the company, and generally have good contact with the different responding agencies. And so every three years, our inspector 
uh, inspects every uh, company that is subject to the RMP program. Right now, that is 18 companies. As of May, uh, that will probably be 17. I'd I say probably because it's not official yet, but there's a company that is planning to deregister. Um, and the process is moving to an adjacent company that they, they did that for. So as the slide says, we uh, feel like it gives us several different um, benefits, including um, better inspection frequency uh, at a national level. The companies are, they are inspecting, I think it was 250 companies in any year across the rest of the country. Um, EPA administers a great portion of the country, with the exception mostly of the southeast. And so their plan is to inspect 200 companies out of the other 13,000 some odd that are in the country. And so obviously with, with the higher inspection frequency, we feel like it gives us a better uh, cooperation with companies and that also helps to reduce the frequency of accident patterns. And uh, that is the primary benefit we see as, as we um, administer it locally. Byron? Byron, this is Michelle. Before you move on, um, would you all mind going back one slide? Uh, we went through that um, slide a little quickly, and maybe we could go um, over that one more time. Okay, um, do you, if you have any kind of specific questions, please let me know, but um, essentially the three different major elements um, are several different elements under each section. Um, so without getting into too much detail, uh, the companies spend a fair amount of time uh, determining what their different hazards are if there is a potential release mechanism, they try to anticipate what that could be and plan for that. Um, in addition, they are also required to analyze what the worst case and alternate case scenarios are and determine what the uh, distance to the endpoint is and then coordinate with, uh, coordinate with local agencies to be aware of what those possible scenarios are and to help um, respond to those. The um, prevention program, as, as we mentioned, there are a number of different items underneath that. Um, so employee training, uh, mechanical integrity, so they will be required to do some non-destructive testing, uh, mechanical testing of equipment. Um, in some cases, there will be requirements that equipment be changed out on a certain schedule. Um, it is driven primarily by industry standards. So that is, for instance, if you're part of a, if you have an ammonia refrigeration system, then there are standard, there's a um, consensus standards group called the International Institute of Ammonia Refrigeration that governs those standards. And obviously that's a group of technical experts in that field that would come up with different requirements for running those, those devices, those processes safely. Um, the response program that is in addition to um, planning for local agencies to be able to help respond or planning to respond yourself. Um, the companies also have to be prepared in case there is a need for health care so they know what the um, potential hazards to uh, employees or to um, citizens off site from the plant would be. All right. And each of these uh, is uh, going to be discussed a little bit more when we get into uh, the uh, portion here. Uh, just a little bit more about uh, RMP here in Louisville. This is a map of where our RMP facilities are with the uh, chemical manufacturing facilities highlighted in red. The reason for that will be uh, a bit more apparent in a minute. Um, and that's overlaid with um, census data on minority population within Louisville. And as you can see, uh, the majority of the 
uh, RMP facilities, and in particular, those chemical manufacturing facilities are in West Louisville and surrounding uh, uh, Rubbertown, basically. Uh, it's the neighborhood where most of those are. Um, and a little information comparing us to the rest of the country. Um, we have the fourth most chemical manufacturing facilities per capita in the country um, as a county um, for decent sized cities. Uh, the reason for filtering uh, for over 500,000 in population is there are one or two counties that have a uh, single facility and say 5,000 people that really skew the results. But for um, areas which have a certain number of facilities or people, um, we're fourth in the nation uh, behind uh, Houston, Texas, Greenville, South Carolina, and Summit County, Ohio. Um, I believe it's Toledo, but I always forget. A little bit more background on um, where we are um, in and in the timeline. Um, in 2013, everybody's probably familiar with the uh, disaster that occurred in West Texas at a fertilizer facility um, when an explosion, a fire led to an explosion that killed, I believe, a dozen people, uh, primarily first responders, as well as one or two um, civilians nearby. Um, in response to that, uh, President Obama did issue an executive order uh, mandating review of a number of nationwide. Uh, it was a result of that that EPA adopted the uh, RMP amendment in January 2017. A couple of minute, a couple of months later, in March 2017, based on petitions from a number of states and industries, uh, EPA convened reconsideration proceedings to take another look at those RMP amendments in 2017. Uh, in 2019, they uh, finalized the RMP reconsideration rule. Uh, so the important thing here, uh, their major the last uh, three years, four years at this point, um, there are the RMP amendments from January 2017 and the RMP reconsideration from 2019. Just want to be clear on those two different things um, because we will be talking just a moment about um, the difference between the two. Um, so this is a table highlighting uh, the major amendments from the RMP amendments rule. Um, the first two, the third party audit and incident invest cause analysis covered facilities with program two or program three processes. These are the, um, so program one basically are the facilities, but DJ, correct me if I'm overgeneralizing, but program one facilities are generally the ones do not have offsite consequences um, in the event of an accident. So that, that hazard analysis shows that they are the, the least risk. Anybody above that, it's program two or program three processes will require RMP amendments rule to conduct a third party audit and an incident investigation root cause analysis after a reportable accident or after a catastrophic release or near miss uh, respectively. Um, major change was the for safer technology alternatives analysis, STAA. This facilities with program three, so just the riskiest facilities um, with regulated processes in paper manufacturing, petroleum and coal products manufacturing, or chemical manufacturing to conduct a safer technology alternatives analysis. Determine that these three uh, uh, industries were the ones which most frequently had significant accidents and so uh, required those industries to conduct this safer technology alternatives analysis every five years to determine if there were safer alternatives to the processes or um, methods or tools that they used at their facilities. There was also a new requirement for emergency response coordination activities. Facilities with program two or three processes were required at least once a year to coordinate with emergency responders. There were also requirements for emergency response by a facility subject to um, emergency response program requirements were required to conduct a full field exercise every 10 years and tabletop exercises every three years, just sort of going over what would happen were there to be an emergency at their facility. And finally, all regulated facilities were subject to new information sharing requirements under the RMP amendments rule. Uh, there was an ongoing requirement to um, 
post publicly how to reach the company to get a copy of certain um, newly public information, as well as the requirements for a community meeting within 90 days of any RMP reportable access. So that's the RMP amendments rule highlighted uh, from January 2017. Uh, and then 2019 on this next slide was the RMP reconsideration rule and highlighted here is what changed from the RMP amendments rule. The third party audit, incident investigation root cause analysis, safer technology alternatives analysis and emergency response coordination activities were rescinded. The emergency response exercises were kept for uh, PA built in more flexibility as how frequently those full field exercises and tabletop exercises occurred, basically um, leaving it to the facilities and the local uh, emergency management or response to coordinate and decide for themselves how often that was required to occur. And on the information sharing, all regulated facilities were still or are still required under the RMP rec reconsideration rule to hold a community meeting within 90 days of a reportable accident. However, there's ongoing requirements to make uh, more information publicly available were rescinded as well. And then finally, um, the uh, uh, draft amendments that we have um, posted to our website and shared through our listserv and will be presenting to our strategy committee next, next Wednesday morning um, is sort of a hybrid between the RMP amendments and the reconsideration rule. With regard to the third party audit and incident investigation root cause analysis, again, these are the requirements for additional analysis after a uh, reportable accident or a catastrophic release or near miss. miss. Um, the draft amendments would um, require both the third party audit and incident investigation root cause analysis but it would be limited to just facilities in uh, North American industry classification system uh, NAICS codes 322, 324, and 325. Again, those are the uh, the uh, paper manufacturing, coal and petroleum products manufacturing, and chemical manufacturing codes. So um, that's what those NAICS codes are short for. Um, the only one within those three that we have facilities for is the chemical manufacturing, which is NAICS code 325. The third party audit and incident and root cause analysis would still be required after an accident or catastrophic accident or um, for any of the chemi chemical manufacturing facilities. As to the safer technology alternatives analysis, uh, the draft amendments would require the STAA um, for the same NAICS codes as in the RMP amendments and for the program level, uh, just the program level three, but only for new processes. So it wouldn't be for every for all of their existing processes, only for new processes. For the emergency response coordination activities and emergency response exercises and information sharing, we have not uh, incorporated any changes from the RMP reconsideration rule. Um, so our updates would be to what is currently in the rule. Um, I should point out that our rule has not been amended since prior to the RMP amendments rule in 2017. So there are still additional new requirements that would be uh, placed into the rule uh, as a result of this if it were adopted. Um, however, it would be uh, equivalent to what is already required by the uh, federal rule. Um, just a couple of quick slides about our regulatory process, just to highlight um, where we've been so far and where we are. Now. Um, this is a slide from our workshop um, that I put together uh, for when we did a, a presentation on our regulatory process in general. Um, usually our regulatory process starts with um, identifying regulations to be developed or revised. That can be uh, an internal need or from um, community uh, making us aware of changes that are, are um, needed or requested. Um, we start with an internal work group. Uh, we form that and scope out what we believe is needed and internal drafting of what would be a proposed rule. We re uh, review that internally and then uh, if it's a significant action, such as this one, we will generally put out a uh, draft for informal public review before proposing it officially uh, through an advance notice of proposed rulemaking. 
and we may have public meetings. After that is when we bring it to the strategy or policy committee as appropriate of the uh, Air Pollution Control Board. They are the ones who officially um, set for formal public review, uh, public comment. And that's the next formal public review, taking public comments and having a public hearing. Finally, after all that is done is when we will bring our recommendation to control board as a whole, uh, which makes the final decision as to whether or not to adopt changes to the rule. And these are highlighting all of the opportunities for public participation uh, within that process. And here's where we are um, within that process at this point um, in this rulemaking. We've already identified the regulation, uh, both because of uh, identification of need internally, as well as community requests and desires for change. Uh, we had an internal work group, which consisted of all of the district people on the call today, as well as a couple of others. We did not draft a proposal um, for release internally. Instead, we had an ANPR that was released previously which outlines a range of possibilities rather than making our specific recommendation at that time. We felt that we needed to uh, get more community feedback on exactly which direction we should head and evaluate what our options were after that. Uh, after internal review, we released that AMPR earlier this year, and we had a couple of public meetings, which many folks on this call were able to attend. Um, and then, Right now, this meeting that we are having at this moment is a new step that we haven't traditionally taken. We're, we're um, having an additional public meeting after having released a actual draft uh, amendments to the rule before bringing it to the strategy uh, or policy board committee, uh, sorry, strategy committee in this case next week. Uh, we thought it, it behooved us to have an additional opportunity for the public to ask any questions now that we have actually put forward draft amendments, and that's the purpose of the public meeting. Um, so we have one more week until that strategy committee meeting. Uh, many people will have questions tonight. If you don't, you still have another uh, week to ask before it goes to the strategy committee. Um, feel free to, to contact us to reach out. Uh, I'll put up a slide with that info in just a little bit. Um, but next week, uh, once we bring it to the strategy committee, we will be requesting that they approve it for uh, release for formal public comment period. Once it's released for formal public comment period, it's not that we cannot uh, answer questions potentially, but generally uh, any comments at that point are made and will become a part of the record and when we make our recommendation to the board, we will put out a formal response to comment document. So it's a formalized process at that point. Uh, comments will be taken and not responded, to, but it's considered during our uh, internal consideration of what recommendation we will make to the board. Uh, so that's that formal public review. And during the public comment period, we will also have a public hearing that will be different from this public meeting. That public hearing will be before the air control board. It will be a very formal affair where folks are welcome to come and make uh, public comments orally to the air pollution control board. And those will be taken just like formal public comments and responded to in a formal uh, response to comment documents when we make our final recommendation to the board. So it won't, there won't be that same opportunity before the board to, to ask questions and, and receive answers and have sort of a more informal dialogue. Uh, the final step will be after that, taken all those comments, considered them, and made our decision as to what final action we recommend to the board, and we will make that recommendation to the board sometime in the future. And here are those opportunities for public comment uh, or public participation again. Just as far as the timeline for what happens after this, uh, today is the public meeting, that green box here. Uh, so there's sort of three steps left here before any rule can be formally adopted. The next step is to bring our uh, recommendation for a what we believe should be officially proposed to the strategy committee next week. Uh, that is a public meeting uh, that will happen next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Instructions for attending that meeting, uh, our docket, um, I'll put up that information where you can find that in a minute. 
Um, but we invite everybody to, to join us uh, and the strategy committee will have an opportunity to review and consider whether to um, allow us to formally release this draft amendment for public uh, formal public comment. Uh, after that, beginning the, that next Friday, uh, December 11th, we will begin a formal comment period. We have decided because of the significance of this action, that will be for 60 days. So the comment period won't close until February 9th, 2021. And you are free to comment at any point during that period. And then and during that comment period, we will also have a public hearing before the board on January 20th, 2021. Uh, that it will be at our regular board meeting, which the public is also welcome to attend, and of course, make comments at. Uh, we do generally appreciate if folks register ahead of time. Uh, there are directions put up on the web for how to do that, but uh, anyone is welcome to come and make a comment at that public hearing. Um, sometimes when we have a uh, regulation which is uh, less significant than this one, or which we do not believe it is generally going to be controversial, we will bring the uh, recommendation of the district to the board at the same time uh, or at the same date as that hearing after the public hearing. Uh, however, this time uh, we do anticipate that this uh, being more significant may um, solicit more comments at that public hearing. So we will have um, our recommendation prepared for the board sometime after that formal comment period and public hearing occur. So not until after February 9th at the earliest, uh, I think the February board meeting is the 17th, um, which may not even be enough time at that point for us to uh, develop that response to comment documents and bring it to the board. But we will announce ahead of time uh, when we are uh, plan to make that recommendation to the board. Uh, and as for implementing the rule, um, those requirements uh, kick in anywhere from days to four years after the formal adoption, if, if it is adopted in the current draft proposed form. Uh, so with that, um, this last slide with a whole lot of tech information, I'll leave up for just a little bit. Um, Louisville case slash APCD slash docket is where you can find all the materials for this draft amended amendment. Um, that is up on the top of the docket at the moment, I believe. Again, that strategy committee meeting will be next Wednesday, December 9th at 9 a.m. The link uh, for instructions on how to join that public meeting uh, is there um, just below that date. Uh, you can also um, call in to access that meeting. If you don't have internet access, the uh, phone number is 415-655-0001. And you'll use access code 180-956-0886. Again, that phone number is 415-655-0001. Access code 180 180- Nine five six zero eight eight six, and that's uh, how you can call into our strategy committee meeting next Wednesday at nine a.m. Um, with that, we thank you for attending the public meeting, and I'll open it up for uh, open discussion and any questions that, that folks may have. Uh, if you have any questions in the next week or so, feel free to reach out to me directly. Uh, that's my phone number at the district. I am working from home uh, pretty much full time. So leave a voicemail. I check it daily and, and we'll get back to you as quickly as I can. Or feel free to email me at byring.gary at louisvilleky.gov. Uh, that phone number is 502-574-7253. Um, and any feedback you have on this meeting or how best to reach the public, uh, feel free to send to airregs at louisvilleky.gov. That goes to myself as well as Rachel Hamilton, uh, who is our secretary treasurer for the Air Pollution Control Board, as well as our assistant director um, and a couple other folks. Uh, Michelle King, our director of program planning, uh, will receive those emails as well. Um, so that's a, a good way to reach out to us in general. Uh, as always, you can also reach us at air at louisvilleky.gov. That's simplest one to remember. Um, and if you didn't get this notice, um, well, you might not be here unless we reached out to you specifically, but if you didn't get this notice, uh, or if you know somebody who didn't and would like to get notices in the future, there is a link there at the very bottom of this slide. Uh, and th these slides will be posted to the web um, along with a recording of this meeting afterwards. Um, so that's how you can direct folks to, sign to get notifications from us for this and, and other significant actions from the district. Uh, with that, 
Um, I'm going to leave that up for, for just a minute, but I'm going to minimize it just so I can. Uh, so Byron, you have a question yeah. in the chat. Um, what prompted the need for change? Um, so there are a number of things that prompted the need. Um, this is one that we had been looking at prior to even the RMP amendments in January 2017. Um, the last amendments to Regulation 515 were from, uh, I believe, 2003, and there have been um, some more minor changes since then. So this is one we needed to update anyway. And then the RMP amendments were all happened in 2017, and we began looking at um, catching up with what was in the RMP amendments. Um, and then pretty soon after that, the reconsideration began. Um, so we sort of slowed action to see how that played out. And then last year that that RMP reconsideration rule was finalized, um, does include provisions that are not in our rule at all right now. Um, and it was the, the federal actions that we were looking at it and that prompted the need for change um, as far as our internal review heard consistently from the community that this is one regulation or where they would like to see more action from uh, Louisville Metro and, and the district specifically um, to ensure that our community, particularly around Rubber Town, uh, is as safe as possible. We have a second question in the chat. Many portions of the RMP incident investigations and reporting were addressed in the Chemical Safety Board. The CSB accidental release reporting rule finalized earlier this year. Has APCD evaluated aligning with the CSB regulation to minimize the burden of redundant reporting? I'm going to stop sharing just so I can see the, the question myself as well. Um, make sure that I keep up with, with everything here. Um, RIP incident investigations reporting chemical safety for accident. DJ, are you familiar with the CSB accident, accidental release reporting rule? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm familiar that they've been working on something and that there's a proposed rule, but beyond that, not really. Um, as general rule, I, I'm, I don't know exactly what's in that. However, um, what, what we require to be reported is anything that would be required in your five-year accident history. So that, that includes, and I'm, I'm reading from the current reg, um, accidental releases from covered processes. So you must be part of the risk management program rule that resulted in deaths, injuries, or significant property damage on site, or known off-site deaths, injuries, evacuations, sheltering in place, property damage, or environmental damage. And um, as a result of the, the uh, good job that the companies generally do and a result of increased inspection frequency and oversight, uh, we don't have very many accidents that really meet this. So um, that is probably, I'd, I'd have to look at that rule and I'd be happy to, to look at that, um, in, look into that uh, alignment. Um, but not knowing what's in it, I, I really can't say whether or not that would be a good good fit for us. Uh, I don't see any other questions right now um, or any raised hands at the moment. Um, we will hang on for a little bit here and make sure that everybody has a chance to sort of digest uh, everything we talked about. And um, if they have any questions, if, even if you, you aren't sure uh, exactly um, what you want to ask or uh, if you want to see anything from that presentation again, uh, feel free to speak up and let us know. I do, I do see another question in the chat, um, and this is uh, the question is, will this affect enforcement in any way? And currently, I don't foresee that it will. Um, you know, honestly, the cooperation we generally get with companies has has been very good. Um, there's not been any any real pushback. Um, 
<laughs> in the past, if if company has made mistakes or had issues, um, we, we have generally resolved it without um, too much disagreement. Um, the approach on anything that is a relatively minor violation um, is to to work with the company to get things tidied up and to get things back in compliance. Now, when I say minor, th there's a lot of the standard that is a paperwork issue. So dotting I's and cross crossing T's is, is generally what we find wrong when we go to these inspections. Um, so we, we do a lot of in, informal enforcement, which is basically a warning letter. Uh, you have a certain time frame, generally 60 days to correct and prove that you've corrected. Um, some of the things, a lot of what we see are, you know, an org chart that was not updated to show the correct individual in charge of um, the process, for example. Um, we see things like that, not regularly, but we do see that um, generally, and then we see some other minor things generally. Um, but, you know, that is mostly how this works on the local level. Um, we have not had a lot of enforcement, um, which again, I think goes to uh, cooperation from the companies in addition to uh, the increased inspection frequency and um, that has seemed to work locally. So um, I'm not sure that, that there would be any effect on enforcement. Thanks, DJ. Uh, there's another question. Um, I mentioned during uh, my presentation that the proposal was initiated in part due to community input. Uh, was the input outside the ANPR process? Uh, didn't see this proposal requested during the ANPR process. So, as I mentioned during my presentation earlier this year, we did initiate uh, an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking uh, and sent out um, sort of a range of options um, proposal and took informal comments and we did put out a uh, informal response to comment documents. Uh, these changes were not specifically requested in, in that document uh, as pointed out in the question. Um, however, this is one where we find often that the community without knowing, you know, specifically to request what changes to regulation 515 or without having read through the full RMP amendments or RMP reconsideration. Uh, and Rachel, Keith, Michelle, feel free to, to jump in. But we, we frequently hear requests for um, ways to make the rubber town area in particular safer. Uh, we hear a lot of concern about potential for accidents, uh, particularly in the, the rubber town area. So I was speaking more to that general sort of community feedback that we hear as we uh, attend community meetings or speak to members of our community, or sometimes even uh, when we're, we're dealing with other um, proposals or other actions that are taken in Louisville Metro generally. I know uh, in particular, um, when the uh, methane plants was being considered in West Louisville, there were a number of community meetings hosted, and one of the major concerns there, for example, was the potential for accidents at a new plant uh, from a community that felt that they were already overburdened by being near to the fence line of a number of chemical facilities in particular. So I was speaking more to that general community input. There was no specific request for these exact changes, uh, which um, given everything that's going on this year, uh, we are not terribly surprised that we haven't had a whole lot of community participation in this process. Uh, and that's part of the reason that we have gone ahead and made a proposal at this point, as explained in the preliminary regulatory impact assessments and the informal response to comment document. There was a request for more opportunity for public inputs in advance of making a proposal, but given the ongoing COVID crisis, as well as the um, unrest related to uh, um, racial tensions in our city, as well as nationwide, uh, we felt that this uh, was probably something that was uh, flying under uh, the um, flying under the radar for uh, that community. Whereas in the past, it has been a bit more of a, a highlight um, however, we do have a need to to make several changes rather than peace knowing it decided to put forward what we in our best judgments 
considered to be something to uh, sort of meet that middle ground. Uh, feel free to, to add anything else. There's another question. I'll read in just a second. But Michelle, Rachel, Keith, or DJ, Matt, anybody from the district, feel free to add to that. Hey, this is Rachel. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to thank Byron for his very uh, fulsome explanation. We do hear a lot from the community about concerns about the risk, not the risk that we deal with under the STAR program, but the risk posed by companies within their communities. So appreciate that, Byron. Great job. Thanks, Rachel. So the next question uh, was, how did you make the determination to include third party audit and root cause analysis provisions from the 2019 reconsideration? Did you determine whether they enhance chemical safety or did you evaluate whether these provisions will create and impose significant administrative burdens and high compliance costs without commensurate benefits to safety? Uh, so this is specifically in regards to the third party audit and root cause analysis provisions. Oh, and and uh, I thank you, Emily. We'll, I'll get to you very next. I'm sorry I missed your hand. Uh, my participants list is far too short. Um, so, uh, and yes, uh, right. So those those two are from the amendments rule. They were rescinded by the reconsideration rule. I think I was understanding uh, anyway. Um, so these two provisions specifically uh, only are required after an accident or a catastrophic accident or near miss. Um, so the reason that we decided to include these in our draft amendments is sort of twofold. Um, one, as shown in the um, cost analysis, which is in the preliminary regulatory impact assessment, um, and is based on the cost analysis from the RMP amendments rule, um, which was largely accepted by the RMP reconsideration rule. They didn't, didn't feel that there was anything significantly off with that. Um, these are not significantly expensive uh, provisions. I don't remember the exact amount offhand, but I can look that up in just a second and give you the, the numbers, but they are in the, the preliminary regulatory impact assessment, the estimated cost of those provisions. Um, so that's one of the reasons. And the second is that because these only uh, are, are required after an accident or near miss, uh, this is something that that wouldn't ever be required if a facility doesn't have an accident or a, a near miss. So for that reason, Louisville being relatively safe uh, with regard to these facilities, as DJ has mentioned, uh, hopefully it's a, a requirement that generally um, will not become effective for the vast majority of our facilities, which makes it not only um, less, um, less costly on a per requirement basis, but it is also less costly in general because it is less likely to even become effective uh, for many of these facilities. Um, and as to the sort of cost compared to benefits, um, both the RMP amendments rule and the reconsideration rule sort of say that uh, there's no way to quantify exactly how much benefit something like this might have. The, these two provisions in particular being sort of um, prospective requirements only required if an accident were to, uh, were to occur um, and the being only in a future, uh, the certainty of, uh, of which occurring is, is unknown as well. It's really difficult to compare, but just in general, um, the estimated uh, amount of avoided accidents uh, or the estimated number of accidents that occur over any given 10 year period um, which might potentially be avoided by something like this uh, is offset by the, 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 the detriments from those accidents is more than um, enough to, to offset the, the limited amount of cost um, from those provisions as estimated by EPA. Um, furthermore, um, there are a number of, aside from being difficult to estimate the exact benefits of any particular rule provision, there are also some just sort of very um, marginal possible events, those sort of catastrophic incidents, you know, the, the Bhopal or the, uh, you know, refinery fires or, or explosions that, that actually do maim, kill, uh, shelter in place, and et cetera, et cetera, um, are very difficult to, to estimate the likelihood of occurring um, and very unlikely to occur. However, even one of those avoided um, is of such a significant benefit uh, 
that it would, would alone offset the entire cost for the community. Um, so those are sort of the, the rationales. Um, they, there is more detail and um, I apologize. I'm, I, I feel I'm much more eloquent when I type something up and have uh, my whole uh, APCD family get the chance to, to review and uh, pick it over first. So that, that Priya probably explains that cost benefit uh, a little bit better than I was able to, but um, yes. Uh, and with that, uh, Emily, thank I, you for pointing out. Oh, sorry. Just, uh, just, just sorry. one thing before you kind of move on to the next question. Yeah. I do, do want to add that um, in addition, we do have a lot of the chemical companies that are already performing root cause analysis related to excess emissions events. And we have seen um, that they do reduce the excess emission events. So there, there's more than, than just um, an indication that they may help. Um, they, they do reduce the amount of excess emission events and most of the chemical companies are already using a formal root cause analysis um, procedure um, as, as a matter of good practice. Thanks, CJ. Okay. Um, Emily, I'm sorry I overlooked you earlier. Uh, feel free to unmute yourself. I lost you in the chat, so if you unmute yourself first, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes, yeah. I understand. Um, so, Emily Thompson, um, I'm with Hexion, and I have a few questions. Um, so, Jefferson County, the proposed requirements that are more stringent than the current EPA rule um, only is going to apply to, I think, nine chemical facilities. Um, am I correct that the chemical facilities have been responsible, uh, according to records provided with your response to comments um, released on October 12th, for only three of the 14 reported RMP incidents? within Jefferson County in the last 25 years, uh, with the most recent being, I think, 20 years ago? Um, that sounds right. I don't have the, the spreadsheet in front of me, but we did put out those accident numbers uh, as part of a response to that informal comment period. Okay. DJ, uh, feel free to correct too. DJ's more familiar with the history there. Go ahead. That sounds right. I don't have them in front of my my um, in front of me right now, but um, I can double check that. Okay, thank you. Um, the next two questions are kind of related, um, so I'll say them together. But if that's too much, then I can split it up. Um, for the covered RMP facilities, does the district intend for the expanded incident investigation requirements to apply to all incidents? and not just those involving an RMP regulated substance um, as well for the additional safer technology alternative analysis requirements for PHAs. Does that apply to non RMP chemical processes as well? Um, the proposed regulation was clear to me on, on that aspect. So I only heard one, but I think sort of related that, that the incident investigation root cause and the third party analysis, are they only required for a accident or a catastrophic accident or a near miss uh, from RMP uh, chemicals? Is that, did I get that right? Okay. Uh, yes, that's my understanding. Um, in particular, the, the um, incident investigation root cause analysis specifically says for a, an RMP covered process, I believe. Um, the catastrophic accident or near miss DJ jump in. I don't don't remember if it is as clear in the proposed language, um, which was borrowed from the RMP amendments rule. Um, I, I don't I, I don't um, should have had that in front of me, but I do have the current version is clear that is for covered processes and that would be the intent for for the uh, draft. Okay. Yeah, uh, on on that, I know the previous or I guess the current uh, uh, version does have the verbiage of regulated substance, whereas in the proposed regulation, that verbiage um, has been removed, at least in the incident investigation portion. So I just wanted to make sure that uh, that intention did not change. That's my understanding of it. Okay, great. Um, one last question. Um, mm -hmm. Does the district intend 
to go beyond the rescinded 2017 federal rule with any aspect of this proposed regulation? The draft language that we have put out is um, no more stringent than the RMP rule and in fact in a number of ways less stringent than because it covers fewer facilities and for the STAA only covers uh, new processes. So uh, I know there's a lot of language in that uh, two page uh, red line strikeout, but everything in there, uh, the language is borrowed from the RMP amendments rule with in a couple of instances um, additional restrictions on where it is applicable. So the draft as proposed or, or as we intend to request the strategy committee approve for proposal. So I'm trying to be careful with my language because it's not officially proposed until the strategy committee uh, approves it. Um, but the draft language that's up on the web uh, is not any more stringent than the RM amendments rule in any way. Okay, great. Thank you so much for answering my questions. Thank you, Michelle. And Michelle has put those um, um, the the link to the um, regulation proposal up on the uh, chat, um, and that's for the ANPR. Um, as mentioned before, the lulky.gov cd slash docket uh, is where you can current draft language. Um, the ANPR that we put out earlier this year is available that Michelle has posted. I think that is all the questions in the chat right now. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes just to make sure everybody has a chance to sort of process the Q&A that's been gone through so far. Um, and feel free to speak up again if anybody wants to see anything like that again. Be glad to, to run through any of that. Um, and also feel free to speak up if I have overlooked and or chat question. And it is 6.57 right now. Probably give it at least until 7 o'clock. Nice round even number. Uh, give everybody a few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to put back up my uh, um, shared screen with all that uh, contact information again. Uh, so, Michelle, if you'd let me know if anybody raises their hand or anything. I uh, just want to make sure there's plenty of opportunity for folks to, to get that contact information too. I think we have uh, folks on the phone too. So just quickly, if you can't see my screen, uh, you can reach out to me directly at 502-574-7253. I am working from home and that's my office number, my voicemail daily. So I will get back to you by the, the next room. Um, so feel free to give me a call uh, if you're accessing any of this information, if you don't uh, understand anything and um, just, sort of had a chance to process afterwards and had additional questions, um, feel free to, to give me a call and I'll do my best to, to clarify uh, for anybody. You can also reach me at byron.gary, that's B-Y-R-O-N dot G-A-R-Y at louisvilleky.gov. Um, once that comment period begins, assuming the strategy committee um, does a for um, the formal comment period, you can comments to air regs a i r r e g s at louisvilleky.gov and those will become a part of the official record there's a link at the bottom subscribe for future updates by email and there's also a link for uh, the docket that's i.gov slash apcd slash docket uh, where this action as well as a number of other proposed actions at the moment are posted and you can see the um, draft 
uh, amendments. Um, they are highlighted with uh, being underlined and uh, struck out the, the various provisions that we changed. There's also a preliminary regulatory impact assessments or PREA that sort of the thinking and uh, changes a little bit further. As well as a brief fact sheet. There is also a link on this final slide to the instructions for joining that strategy committee meeting next week. Byron, while we're waiting, this is Keith. Uh, yeah, I did want to go. I did want to go back to the question that was proposed about community input and why we proceeded with this proposal. And I wanted yes. to add just a little bit more context to that. And it really boils down, part of what it boils down to is this an environmental justice issue. We have a community in Rubbertown that uh, bears a disproportionate share of the uh, exposure from emissions and also the exposure and the risk from any kind of uh, accident. And it, in, in terms of uh, that disproportionate risk, we as an entire community benefit from having these companies in our community. We benefit from the jobs they create, the entire community benefits from the tax base that it, that it creates, uh, but we have a smaller portion of our community that bears a disproportionate share of that risk, and we really thought and I felt that it was prudent from an environmental justice standpoint uh, that we make uh, uh, very thoughtful and prudent attempts to uh, reduce that risk uh, through this uh, legislation and so that's part of the reason why we wanted to uh, uh, we thought it was important that we uh, address this in this proposal thanks Keith. I'm sorry Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just gonna point out there was one more um, comp or question in the chat I know you would yep. see it with the screen up um, I can and sometimes I can't so um, I was just going to expand on, on what Keith said. I just wanted to point out, I went back to this slide since that, that is uh, what Keith was talking about. Um, uh, this, I, I showed the slide and, and uh, I tend to sort of steamroll, so I didn't um, even put the right words to it. Thank you, Keith, uh, for pointing out environment this issue. Where we hear a lot um, and where we hear frequently is fence communities. Um, and I, I think. What Keith said reminded me um, from the sort of general comments that we have heard from the community and concerns about the will there have been of um, national forums in which Louisville has been mentioned. Um, there was a report a year or two ago, um, Life at the Fence Line, described a number of different communities across the country with a disproportion of hazardous um, facilities surrounding or in uh, predominantly black and low income and minority communities. Uh, Lul is one of the communities in that. Uh, in addition, uh, during the RMP reconsideration process, the EPA accepted comments and Lul was specifically mentioned uh, as a community uh, where there was concern about the number of chemical facilities in a predominantly um, black community. Um, so I just wanted to explain, expand on that. Um, but yes, thank you, uh, Michelle, for pointing out the comments in the chats. Uh, will public comment be accepted at the strategy committee meeting next week? Um, let me on the exact problem. From my memory, it's pretty much the same as our uh, board hearings. So there is generally an opportunity for um, the, the public to weigh in on what action the strategy committee should should take. Um, it It is a... a um, officially required public meeting. It is not, or hearing. it is not um, the, the sort of informal, they tend to be less formal than our board meetings. It is uh, not as informal as this, so there won't be the chance for this sort of dialogue that we're having now necessarily. Um, although the strategy committee themselves have the opportunity to ask questions of the district and, and what exactly we're requesting. But um, generally, yes, there is an opportunity for uh, public participation at the strategy committee meeting as well. And Michelle also posted the uh, longer version of the uh, louisvilleky.gov slash epcd slash dockets. Um, that, that's the short version of the, the link that Michelle has posted in the chat. 
as one more way for, for folks to be able to, to access this. Just bring up this slide one more time for folks to have the opportunity to uh, get down any information they need um, and give it uh, maybe just a couple more minutes and see if anybody else has any other questions. This is last best chance to ask questions and get the whole APCD management team to answer you. Um, so if anybody else has any last questions, now's the time. Um, again, feel free to reach out uh, before the strategy committee meeting if anything else occurs to, uh, to you. Um, my number is 574-7253. Leave me a voicemail and I will get back to you. Um, or byron.gary at louisvilleky.gov. Um, if you uh, don't want to talk to me directly, you can always reach out to the district generally at air at louisvilleky.gov or airregs at louisvilleky.gov, a bit more limited uh, grouping of folks who, who deal with these regulatory amendments. Uh, and with that, I'm going to make one more scroll through, see if we have any other hands up or questions in the And I'm not seeing any. Um, so I'm going to say that that is the end of discussion. Uh, and thank everybody so much for um, attending this public meeting regarding uh, draft amendments to Regulation 515, Version 4, Chemical Accident Prevention Provisions. A recording of this meeting will be uh, posted to the web, hopefully as early as tomorrow, along with these slides. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody next week at the Strategy Committee meeting, December 9th, 2020 at 9 a.m. Those instructions are on the docket along with this proposed action. Uh, with that, thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening. Thank you.